at it. It's only when we think it's my pain, it's my face recording, it's like a camel. It's, it's my, when it's always my, that's called attachment and that's where we lose the plot as they say. We get attached, we're not at peace anymore. Even your mind. How many of you are at peace with your meditation, with your success or failure, whether you're, you're in jhanas or not? It's not your mind. It's not your business to get into deep meditation. So leave it alone. Who gets into jhana anyway? Just process, that's all. So when it's not my mind, it's not my problem, then you stop striving. When you stop striving, then jhanas happen. So what are you trying to do? You try to get enlightenment? If you try to get enlightenment, there's this big I, me, which is blocking enlightenment happening. So you take that me out of the way. You take that I out of the way. You take that my out of the way. And then there's nothing between you, the jhanas, enlightenment and everything. Understand? No, you don't. <laughs> it's okay. Next question. That's over here. Ajahn. When we say, may I be well and happy, who is talking? Doer or knower? When you said that this morning, when we say, may I be well and happy, who is talking? I was talking. <laughs> but then you say, Ajahn Brahm. Were you talking or was Ajahn Brahm's non-self talking? And when I think, I, may I be well and happy, I know that was Ajahn Chah talking. And when Ajahn Chah was talking, was it Ajahn Chah talking? No, it was Ajahn Man, his teacher talking. When you trace it all back, where these ideas and thoughts come from, they all come from the Buddha. So actually when you say, may I be well and happy, it literally is the Buddha talking. That's who said that. Not you, but the Buddha. Isn't that wonderful? It's not the doer, it's not the knower. The Buddha started all of this. When you pass the buck, who calls this? The buck stops with the guy behind me, the Buddha. It's wonderful. Why do you meditate? Because the Buddha told you to. He told his disciple, who told his disciple, who told his disciple. And that's been conditioned all the way down the line. And now you're sitting here. And you let go, you practice jhanas, you meditate. Why? Because 2,500 and so years ago, the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree, that's why. When you understand cause and effect, it's powerful. Amazing. Two, please elaborate how to note the space between the breaths. Okay, if you can't do this yet, you can say, take the three refuges inside. I go to refuge, I go for refuge to the Buddha, I go for refuge to the Dhamma, I go for refuge to the Sangha, but say it slowly. I go for refuge to the Buddha, pause. And listen what happens in the mind after you've said that, after you've thought that. And then you say, I go for refuge to the Dhamma, pause. See the space between the refuges. Because you'll find when you say, I go for refuge to the Buddha, it's a powerful statement and the mind actually goes towards where that signpost is pointing. The mind goes for refuge. In the same way, all words have power. Sometimes we don't listen to their, their echo, their resonance afterwards. For example, hate. Hate! Hate! What happened in your mind after I said that word? Actually the mind started going towards hatred. It was a signpost for the mind and the mind followed after that. Love. Listen after I, I finish the word. Love. Love. Can you see your mind going in that direction? That's why words have power. Sometimes that we stop, 
We don't stop, sorry, after the word. We go on to the next word, so we never see where the signpost is leading. So, I go for refuge to the Buddha. Pause. And in that silence, you see the meaning. The silent meaning. I go for refuge to the Dhamma. I go for refuge to the Sangha. That's what we mean by silence. It's a feeling, a thing of the mind, which has no words. Like the signpost points to the town. When we get to the town, we don't need a signpost anymore. The words have done their job. The thought has finished. Because we've got to where the thought was pointing. So try that. If you haven't managed to get silence yet, recite the three refuges to yourself. But pause between each refuge and listen. Listen with everything you've got to the beautiful silence which reverberates after you've gone for each refuge. Okay. That makes sense? Okay, next question. De Ajahn, is mindfulness only present at present moments? Can it also exist in the past and future? Can you explain in Samadhi how effort, mindfulness and concentration play their role in leading into deep concentration? Okay. Really, if you are in the past, you're not really mindful of what's really happening now, are you? Sometimes people are like that. They're driving their car and they're thinking of the argument they just had with their wife and they go crash, bang, because they're not being mindful of the traffic. Some people sort of are mindful of the future or they're not mindful, so they're thinking of the future. What are we, what's going to happen? There's only how many days to go? And you're thinking of all the things which are going to happen to you once you finish this retreat and all the business and stuff. You're not mindful of the present moment. Really, mindfulness, attentiveness has to be on the present moment. That's why if you're in the past and the future, you're not really mindful, not in the Buddha's way. And you, the Buddha also um, described mindfulness. He defined it as like memory, being able to remember things said and done a long time ago. That's one of the definitions. What's mindfulness to do with memory? I'll tell you. If you're really attentive to this moment, it registers in the mind. It's easy to remember. If you're off in the future and the past, you don't remember anything. Which is why that if you're learning sort of a course, if you're at a lecture, all you need to do is to make your mind very peaceful, attentive to the moment, and then it's very easy to remember what's been said and done. Recently, before I came on this trip to Singapore and Malaysia, we had a very great monk visiting our monastery for seven days, as Ajahn Pliyan from the north of Thailand. And when he gave a talk, he can understand English very well, but he can't speak English. So when he was giving a talk to the monks, someone had to translate, and that was me. I had to translate from Thai into English for him. However, that sometimes when you have a talk which is translated, the talker, speaking in Thai, really gets into his subject and starts getting some interesting dharma and it doesn't stop until 15 minutes have gone. You've got a whole 15 minutes of information, he turns around to you, bum wang, so translate. So you've got to translate a whole 15 minutes. How can you do that? It's very easy to do. All I need to do is when he's giving that talk, I listen. I don't try, if you're trying to remember, you're not listening. So just make your mind very still, very peaceful. Just allow the words to flow through. And when he's finished, he turns around, Brahma Wangsa, translate. Then the words just come back again. They just flow. And the monk sitting next to me, sort of, uh, I was very tired at the time, the boy was very busy. The monk sitting next to me, I turned to Tamala, he looked at me, that's amazing, how can you do that? So 50 minutes, he was listening as well. He said, I can't remember anything that you missed. So you can do that because your memory comes from samadhi, the peaceful application of sati. When sati, mindfulness, is focused in the moment, it lets go, never tries to... Actually, I, I did miss something on, on one of the sections there. 
And I knew I'd missed it as soon as it happened because he said something very interesting. And I saw my mind going out towards that interesting thing to grasp it. And I realized as soon as I did that, it's like pressing the delete button. And I lost a lot of what was happened before. And actually, you can actually see yourself doing that. When you're actually listening to something, you know, if I said something very interesting and you grasp it, you've forgotten all that went before. That's how you have a great memory. You've got to listen absolutely passively and not go out anything. So as soon as you go out to capture it, you're not truly listening. That's that why samadhi, when it's uh, attached or when it's alongside mindfulness, it's very powerful. You get great memory. So, and how can I explain samadhi, effort and mindfulness and concentration play their role in leading into deep concentration? Okay, the mindfulness is the supervisor. Sees what you're doing. It's there in the moment because where, the, where you're acting is now. The future, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. You can't stop acting in the future because that's coming next. The past is already done. So mindfulness is wasting its time in the past. It's wasting its energy in the future. So mindfulness, the supervisor, is right now. Seeing what the workers are doing in this moment. Not worried about what they did a few moments ago or last week. That's finished, that's done. You're looking at the workers now. The supervisor. And the effort of the supervisor is just to make sure the supervisor, the, the workers don't slack off. They don't slack off into craving or attachment. So the supervisor has to make sure you're always doing the job. And the job is letting go. So the supervisor has to keep this beautiful freedom, peace, compassion, liberation where you don't grasp, where you don't force, where you don't strive, you don't crave. Because it's always in the, in the moment. If as long as you're striving and craving, you're off into the future somewhere. You're not really being present. You're not allowing the process to evolve. The supervisor just has to make sure that that sun is warming the lotus. He doesn't have to do anything. just has to make sure everything is going according to nature. The effort is the effort of a gardener. I don't know how many teachers have told me this. It's the effort of a gardener. The seed is planted. The rain provides the moisture. The sun provides the the warmth. There's enough fertilizer in the soil. All a gardener needs to do is to protect it. To make sure that no hindrance, no craving comes to disturb the growth of the plant. So the effort is one of protection, nurturing. Not pulling the plants to stretch them not putting this fast fertilizer on it. I want the quick way to enlightenment. But allowing it to grow naturally, which is always the best. So that's the role of effort. And you can understand this because the Buddha did say the right effort is what arouses wholesome qualities and maintains them. Right effort is what abandons unwholesome qualities, keeps them away. So you know it by its results. If wholesome qualities are growing, such as peace, happiness, freedom, you know, that was right effort. If unwholesome states of mind start to develop, headaches, tension, despondency, you know you've been doing wrong effort. Many of you have discovered, like I discovered a long time ago, that when you let go, when you relax, when you do loving kindness, peace, that's when the wholesome qualities grow. You feel it, the peace, the energy, the increased mindfulness, the love, the compassion. But when I strive, I get tense, I get grumpy, I get angry. When they're striving, unwholesome qualities grow. You don't believe me, strive. Try and get enlightened. Try to get limiters. You find the more you try, the worse it gets, the more the unwholesome qualities. It's craving, attachment, grasping. But when you relax and let go, you find, as many of you have in this retreat, the wholesome qualities have been increasing. 
That's why when people actually complain, Ajahn Brahm, you should get people to be more strict. And I said, you try, have a strict retreat, you'll watch more unwholesome qualities grow. People become tense. They even get sick. But you try this way, and you find most of the meditators, those who follow the instructions and stop their striving, they get all these beautiful, wholesome qualities. At last, they feel peace. They feel no stress. They feel happiness. They feel joy. The meditation gets deeper. They are more mindful. They're closer to Nibbana. And you can feel that. So you actually know what right effort is and what wrong effort is on this retreat. Every time you strived, what happens? Every time you've really let go, what happens? Next question. Dear Van Ajahn, we aspire to attend the next Buddhist conference in Perth and also to stay at your monastery for a week or so. Can you please let us know the exact date? I think you know what I'm going to say about this, don't you? You might not live to that time. It's a long time in the future. It's something past tomorrow and that's too far in the future for me. So the exact date, there is no exact date. It's just fantasies and dreams. That's what the future is. The only time you have is now. So forget about the conference. If your monastery is fully booked, can we bring sleeping bags and park ourselves along the corridors or in the garage? Thank you. <laughs> Who knows what you can do? If you are very wise and if you really follow the instructions on this retreat, your mind will be your monastery. The conference will come to you. You will always be in the global conference of peace and serenity. You will be so enlightened, you won't need any conferences ever again. Wouldn't that be nice? The conferences are only for those people who don't know the Dhamma, who have want some more inspiration. Look, as a teacher, I'm trying to get rid of disciples. I've already got too many. I want to get rid of you all. It is true. I'm trying to get rid of each one of you. Just like any teacher in a school tries to get rid of their students, the teacher's whole aspiration is for you to graduate and to leave school. My aspiration, my wish, is for each one of you to get so deep into meditation, so enlightened, you never need to come and listen to any talk of mine ever again. Or of any other monk or nun. I am trying my hardest to get rid of you. I must be a terrible teacher because more of you keep coming every day. <laughs> but anyway, the <laughs> imagine if I was a school teacher. If I was a school teacher people kept on repeating my class year in, year out, year in, year out. I would be considered a terrible teacher. <laughs> okay, point made. In walking meditation, which pace achieves better results? Snail's pace, easy pace or fast pacing? Okay, just any old pace will do. So you have nature pace. So whatever happens that uh, you just allow it to flow. There are some times when that you want to walk fast. Allow yourself to walk fast. Sometimes you want to walk so slowly. Allow yourself to walk slowly. Allow the feet to take, set the pace. And your mind just follows. The feet are the pacemakers. Your mind, it just follows on behind. Okay? So you don't set the pace. Let the feet set the pace. You just follow the feet. Is there any true stories where the previous life was ghost or animal, etc., other than human? Yeah, there's sometimes people have those experiences of being an animal before. Is this? Okay, I'll tell you this story. There in one of the monasteries in Thailand, and one of the abbots of that monastery comes to visit us every now and again. Not Ajahn Plin, but another monk who visited I think it was in October, just after the Katina, early November, sorry. We you know like many monasteries in Thailand, 
that if you have any animals you don't want to look after, they dump them in the monastery. But in particular, that somebody found this poor monkey who had been kept...